So right off the bat, if the 3.5 millimeter headphone jack is important to you, then the Pixel 3a is probably a better buy than the Pixel 3. But for just about anyone else, I think the trade-offs are a little much, especially when you can get a refurbished Pixel 3 for $449. So for $50 more, you get Gorilla Glass, you get the Pixel Visual Core, you get water resistant, you get a faster modern processor, you get the wide angle selfie camera. All this for an extra $50 on a refurbished device, which will still come with the full warranty. Welcome to Geared Up, brought to you by National Car Rental. I'm Andrew Edwards. Geared Up is your weekly show taking you through all the biggest news in the world of tech and consumer electronics. And this week, we're going to be going over one of the biggest events of the year, that being Google I.O. and the keynote, which took place yesterday morning. We've got some Google hardware announcements to go over the new Pixel 3a and 3a XL, as well as the new Nest Hub Max. And we're also going to talk about Google Duplex on the web. But as promised last week by popular demand, we will be starting off today by talking about iOS 13 and the big reported feature leaks that hit Bloomberg earlier this week. So if you want to find out what is coming in Apple's next major mobile operating system for the iPhone, the iPad and the iPod Touch, that's what we're starting with today. So let's get into it. Here's what's going to be new in iOS 13. Now, all this news comes from Mark Gurman over at Bloomberg. Last week, we covered his rumors talking about what's coming in the next version of macOS, the follow-up to macOS Mojave. That's Apple's desktop computer software platform. Now we're talking about iOS. First and foremost, iOS 13 is going to be another speed enhancement and bug killing release, which to me is actually a little surprising because iOS 12, the current version of iOS, was specifically seen and pitched by Apple as the speed enhancing and bug killing release. So it's nice to see Apple continuing to make sure speed gets improved, especially on older devices as people are holding onto their devices for longer these days. And that we don't have to expect new major bugs coming with the rest of the new features that are going to be in iOS 13. You know, one thing that was interesting last year was when the beta was released for iOS 12. That first beta was almost more stable and more solid than iOS 11 was nine months into its life cycle. Now, it wasn't as solid, but it was almost as solid. And typically with the first beta, you can expect it to perform for lack of a better term, horribly. It's the first beta is typically terrible to run. It's slow. Your phone runs hot. Last year with iOS 12, that wasn't the case. So we'll see what happens here with iOS 13, the beta of which should be dropping in June, the first day of WWDC. The home screen for iOS 13 has pretty much remained almost exactly the same since the original iPhone launch back in 2007. 12 years later, the iOS home screen is still multiple rows of app icons. One change that we did see was that you're able to add folders to your home screen now, which was not in the original release of iOS. But other than that, the home screen has remained pretty much the same. But starting with iOS 13, we should be seeing some changes, at least as pertains to the iPad home screen. Now, one thing that no one has reported is what these changes will be, what these changes will look like. However, Apple actually wanted to update the home screen last year with iOS 12, but they held off on that update, focus on speed and to focus on bugs. So now a year later, we're going to see the change to the home screen, at least on the iPad. I'd love to see it obviously happen on both the iPad and the iPhone, the iPhone being the most used iOS device in the world would likely benefit from new home screen features, whether that's just the ability to place app icons anywhere you want without having to use the dedicated grid, whether it's placing widgets on the home screen, whatever it might be, iOS is certainly overdue for a more advanced home screen. So this is what I'll be watching. I'm very curious to see what Apple's gonna do with what will be for all intents and purposes, the first actual update to the home screen for iOS. We can also expect new animations, new animations for multitasking. That's when you pull up from the bottom of the screen or double tap the home button if you're using a device with a home button. Double tap when you go into that multitasking view where you can see the different cards for all your apps. We're gonna get a new animation there as well as a new animation for closing apps. And I assume this may have something to do with or match up with that new home screen refresh as well. One thing people have been asking for for years is a system-wide dark mode on iOS 
Now, we're going to be talking about Google I.O. later in the show, but I just want to mention here, Google did announce a new dark mode called Dark Theme for Android Q, the next version of Android that will be shipping. So Dark Theme is coming to Android. Dark mode is also coming to iOS with iOS 13. There will be a toggle in the control center that you can just tap on, and that toggle is going to allow you to quickly switch between the normal theme, which I assume will now be called the light theme, and a system-wide dark mode. This dark mode will take advantage of OLED displays in particular, but it'll work on devices that also have LCD displays. And if you're familiar with dark mode on the Mac, you know that dark mode basically changes the interface elements of the apps from brighter colors like whites and beige over to darker colors like black and gray. It's easier on the eyes when you're in a dark environment, and it's also easier on your battery as well, especially on an OLED display, because anything that's black on an OLED display, those pixels are actually turned off. So if you're using something like an iPhone 10 and the top half of your display is a black square and the bottom half of your display is a white square, that black square at the top, that's actually turned off. So half your screen is powered off in that scenario. So with a dark mode, with much of the pixels being black, that means a lot of your display is actually powered off, which will save on battery life. We'll be seeing new app updates with iOS 13 as well. First, the health app is going to get a daily tab to give you a quick look at your health during the day. We should also get a better fleshed out sleep tracking area, an area for menstrual cycle tracking and a hearing damage tracker, which is interesting. I'm assuming that's something where you open it up if you're in a loud environment and it'll tell you based on the microphones on the device, if you're in an environment where you're damaging your hearing permanently. Just my assumption, but that'll be interesting to see when it's announced. The Reminders app is going to get its first big redesign. Apparently, we're going to get four sections in the built-in Reminders app. We're going to get a today view of tasks that need to be done today, a view that shows all your tasks, a view that shows scheduled tasks, tasks that have a specific due date, and an area that shows flagged tasks, which is tasks that you personally have flagged whether they have a due date or not. We're also expecting a new Find My Friends slash Find My iPhone app. So basically taking those two apps that exist today, merging them into one. So basically find whatever I'm looking for app, see where your friends are, see where your devices are. And the rumor is that Apple will also be releasing a new hardware product that will allow you to track pretty much anything. Similar to that company Tile, they sell a small tile square that you can put in luggage or on your bags or in your wallet. And if you lose any of these things, you can open up the Tile app and see on a map where these devices are. The rumor is Apple's going to have something that competes with that. So you'd buy an Apple device, put it in your luggage, put it in your purse, etc. And now you can track that in this same app as well. Another interesting piece coming out of the report is that iMessage is set to become a little bit more of a social network, just a little bit. It's not actually going to become a social network, but similar to AOL Instant Messenger back in the day, iMessage users will now be able to set public or private screen names and also set a profile picture. So what that means is if I set a profile picture for myself and I send you an iMessage to your device, even if you don't have a profile picture set for me in your contacts, my profile picture will come through. So this should make it a lot easier to know who's contacting you through iMessage right off the bat, because often I'll hand my phone to someone so they can add themselves to my contacts list, but it's rare that someone also opens up the camera and takes a selfie of themselves so that I can have a face with the name when they first send me a message. So this should be cool, interesting, small feature, but I think it'll actually have a nice effect for iMessage users. And the last big one I wanna talk about is the ability to use the iPad as a secondary display for the Mac. So Apple will be releasing a feature in iOS 13 that will allow your iPad, whether it's an iPad or iPad Pro, I don't know if it's just for the iPad Pro, but you'll be able to take an iPad and use it as an additional display for your Mac. So maybe you wanna have certain apps showing just on your iPad to the side to make your Mac display less cramped, but even cooler, Apple Pencil support on the iPad will translate over to the Mac. So in other words, let's say you open up a PDF document that requires your signature and you happen to have your Apple Pencil. You can move that PDF document to the iPad display, sign it with your Apple Pencil, and that signature will transfer over into the Mac. Very cool stuff. I'm interested to see how that'll work. And again, we'll be finding out at WWDC in just about 
one month. Those were the major features that were reported by Bloomberg that we should be seeing in iOS 13. If there's any features you want to see in iOS 13, or if you have any thoughts on any of the features I just talked about, be sure to hit me on Twitter at Andrew Edwards or in the comments on YouTube over at youtube.com slash gear live. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Up next, we will be talking about Google IO and some of the big announcements that Google made at their annual developers conference. That's coming up next on Geared Up. Welcome back to Geared Up. I'm Andrew Edwards, and it is now time for the National Car Rental Story of the Week. Big shout out to National Car Rental for sponsoring Geared Up. And if you're a business traveler, you should check out the other show I do for National Car Rental. That one is called Technically Speaking. On Technically Speaking, I talk about the best tech gear for business travel. Now, obviously, travel in general can be made easier by tech, can be made more fun by tech, and can be made more efficient by tech. So if you're a business traveler, technically speaking, it's for you. But even if you travel just for leisure and personal reasons, that show will not lead you astray. If you want to check out my regular tech picks for travelers, be sure to head over to the nationalcar.com control center, or you can check it out at youtube.com slash national car rent. Again, big thank you to National Car Rental for sponsoring Geared Up. The latest tech puts you in the driver's seat. National Car Rentals Emerald Club will keep you there. Now onto the National Car Rental story of the week. The big annual Google I.O. keynote took place yesterday morning. Bunch of new announcements coming out of Google. And one in particular that stood out on stage was Google Duplex on the web. And coincidentally, National Car Rental, the sponsor of Geared Up, was also featured in that segment for Google Duplex on the web. So if you remember Google Duplex last year, Google at I.O. announced that you can use the Google Assistant to call and make reservations, whether it be at restaurants or another example used was hair salons. So you could have the Google Assistant make the phone call for you, speak to the person, knowing your preferences, set the reservation, and then add it into your Google Calendar for you. It was cool. Some people said it was creepy because it sounded like a real person making the call, but it's really a robot making the call. But this year, they announced Google Duplex on the web. And so how that works is that the Google Assistant fills in everything on the web automatically when you make a request. The example they gave on stage was the phrase, hey, Google, book a national car rental for my upcoming trip. And so again, what we saw was the Google Assistant open the web page for National Car Rental, automatically fill out the form, pick the car, and then as the flow went on, the user was able to confirm what the assistant had done. The Google Assistant understands the date of your trip and your vehicle preferences based on confirmations previously found in your Gmail and in your Google Calendar. So it's basically just filling out the web form and making selections very quickly and then allowing you to confirm them as it's going through it, saving you a bunch of time. Google said Google Duplex on the web is coming later this year. Now, it should be said, this isn't something that's exclusive to National Car Rental or anything, but apparently Google used them as the example because their back end for booking vehicles didn't require any extra engineering work due to National's web and mobile platforms already being engineered to allow these newer technologies to work for them today. Now, that said, you can imagine in the near future doing something like this with movie tickets or restaurant reservations or really anything where you open a web page and fill out a form and make choices. So imagine being able to say to the Google Assistant, buy me two movie tickets to see Avengers Endgame this Saturday night. And then the assistant would open the web page to buy the tickets. It knows based on previous confirmations where your favorite theater is, what seats you typically like to purchase and what time you normally like to go to the movies. And it just makes all these selections automatically and then shows you at the end once it's filled everything out and picks something for you, everything that it's done and all you need to do is simply tap on confirm and you're good to go. Other Google Assistant news we saw, the Google Assistant AI can now be stored directly on your phone. Google was able to bring it down from 100 gigabytes in size down to half a gigabyte. And the result is that using your phone with your voice can actually be faster than tapping your phone to use it. So they showed what they're they're calling this the next generation assistant and they demoed it. And so the woman on stage basically opened several apps back to back. So for example, open Instagram, open Facebook, open Twitter, open photos, etc. Just opening a bunch of apps back to back to back. 
Then it was set a timer for 10 minutes, order a lift ride, turn a flashlight on, turn a flashlight off, take a selfie, get today's weather, what's the weather tomorrow? So all of these different requests made back to back to back, and each time she gave a command, instantly the app that she wanted popped up into view. So obviously the point of the demo was to show that doing this all by voice was much faster than tapping into and out of apps trying to get to the features that you wanted. Another demo using the same technology showed replying to a text message so someone text you saying, hey, how was your trip? You use your voice to respond back, the trip was great. Then you ask the Google Assistant to bring up photos from your recent trip. Then you say, just show me photos of animals. Then you tap on the photo of one animal and then you tell it to send that photo to the person you're texting with. So again, Google Assistant year by year grows more and more powerful. It's hard not to argue that Google is way ahead of any other competition when it comes to what the Google Assistant can do. And that's compared to other assistants like Alexa or Siri. The new on-device Google Assistant is gonna ship with Pixel phones later this year. Generally, those ship in October. But if you have a current Pixel phone, you can actually download the Android Q developer beta. And I believe you can give it a shot right there on your current device. That was your look at the Google Assistant news from Google I.O. After the break, we'll talk about two of the big Google hardware announcements from Google I.O. That's coming up next on Geared Up. Welcome back to Geared Up. I'm Andrew Edwards. For this last segment, let's talk about the hardware releases, the hardware announcements that came out of the Google I.O. keynote. First up, there are a pair of new Pixels in town, and they're actually on sale right now. It's the new Google Pixel 3a and Google Pixel 3a XL. And what these are are cheaper versions, mid-range versions of the Pixel 3. So the Pixel 3a costs $399. And if you want the XL version with a bigger display, that costs $479. They're available in three colors, those being just black, clearly white, and purple-ish. Google always likes to play around with the names of the colors of their smartphones. Um, stereo speakers, they are not front-facing speakers. One of them is downward firing, so that's the difference from the Pixel 3. You get USB-C digital audio, Bluetooth 5.0, and you also get a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, which you do not get on the regular Pixel 3 and Pixel 3 XL. You get the same high-end computational photography found on the Pixel 3, which has kind of been the Pixel's calling card since the first one. It is a really good camera, or at, at the very least, it may not be a really good camera, but the Pixel 3 using its camera and using Google's AI and machine learning is able to produce really good photos. You get free unlimited Google photo storage, but you don't get unlimited photo storage at full quality like you do with the Pixel 3. You get high quality, which means they dumb down the quality a little bit while storing your photos online. Google says battery life is a big deal here. They say it's an adaptive battery for up to 30 hours per charge. And by plugging into a fast charger, you'll get seven hours of battery life with a 15 minute charge. That claim needs to be tested. I'd be shocked if the average person is getting 30 hours of battery life per charge. The other big thing is that instead of just being a Verizon exclusive, the Pixel 3a is available on Verizon, T-Mobile, Sprint, and US Cellular, so you can go into any of these stores and see the Pixel 3a and buy them there. And that's one of the big things for phone manufacturers. You need to have your phones in the stores of carriers, not just exclusively to one carrier, but multiple carriers. So we'll see if this helps increase the footprint of the Google Pixel, which quite honestly, over the past couple of years has not sold well at all, despite being a very capable phone. As I mentioned, the Pixel 3a went on sale as soon as it was announced. And I guess the question is, who is this phone for? 399 bucks, plastic phone, it's not glass, it's not metal, it doesn't have Gorilla Glass, doesn't have water resistance, it doesn't have the Pixel visual core, there's no wireless charging, there's no wide angle selfie camera. Again, you do get the great photos that the Pixel's known for, and you do get a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, which you don't get on the regular Pixel. So right off the bat, if the 3.5 millimeter headphone jack is important to you, then the Pixel 3a is probably a better buy than the Pixel 3, if that is a deal breaker for you. But for just about anyone else, I think the trade-offs are a little much, especially when you can get a refurbished Pixel 3 for $449. So for $50 more, you get Gorilla Glass, you get the Pixel Visual Core, which is the image signal processor, which basically takes care of processing the photos you take and making them look as good as they do. You get water resistant, you get a faster modern processor, you get the wide angle selfie camera. All this for an extra $50 on a refurbished device which will still come with the full warranty. Now, obviously, I know the average consumer out there is probably not going to realize that they can get an inexpensive refurbished Pixel 3. And I'm sure there's other people who may realize that but don't want 
a refurbished device. They like to buy new devices and they look at the price between the Pixel 3 and the Pixel 3a and they see Pixel 3a is almost half price when compared to the Pixel 3. I'm not saying I think this is a bad device. I'm just saying I think when you look at the price difference between what you get for a Pixel 3a, and what you can get for a refurbished Pixel 3 or used Pixel 3, I don't know that the savings there, roughly $50, is worth going with a 3a. But I'm curious to hear what you guys think. Pixel 3a, mid-range smartphone, high-end camera, or again, I, I need to correct myself, high-end photos. I don't think the Pixels actually have the best physical camera hardware out there, but I do think that Google is able to use the camera that they have with the AI that they have to produce some of the best looking photos out there. So what do you guys think of a mid-range priced phone with mid-range specs that is able to capture what many people will say are the best photos you can take on a smartphone. If you could have the best camera, will you accept mid-range everything else? Or would you take a slightly worse camera? Again, going with the court of public opinion here, a Samsung Galaxy S10, an iPhone XS, both still take fantastic photos, maybe not as good as the Pixel, but all the other specs blow the Pixel 3a out of the water. Which one is more important to you? Is it all about the camera when it comes to smartphones or is it all about the entire total package. Let me know on Twitter at Andrew Edwards or message me on Instagram at Andrew. Let me know what you think. Secondly, real quick, let's talk about the new Nest Hub Max. First of all, Google is rebranding all of their smart home devices as Google Nest rather than having a separation between Google and Nest. So now it's Google Nest. So we've got the Google Nest Hub Max. This is similar to the Google Home Hub where you get a display on top of a speaker. So you get a larger display here. It's a smart home dashboard. It's got a built-in camera so it can be used as a Nest camera. Similar to a Nest camera, you can open the Nest app remotely on your smartphone, on your tablet, and see what the camera sees. You can also use the camera for video calls using Google Duo. And you can also leave video messages for household members. So let's just say in the morning, you're about to leave for work someone else is in the shower, you can leave a video message for that person. And then when they get, let's just say into the kitchen where the Hub Max is located, they can watch the video message you left for them. It's got face match built in. So when you walk in front of the camera of the Nest Hub Max, it'll recognize you and who you are, and it'll show you your information rather than anyone else's information. So it'll show you your calendar, for example, or the news that it thinks you want to see. But then if someone else walks in front of it, it'll show them their calendar and news that they want to see. It's also got YouTube and YouTube TV built in. And so again, if you have this in your kitchen, now you have a kitchen TV. You can watch YouTube, you can watch YouTube TV, which is YouTube's TV service that allows you to watch your local TV channels and cable channels. And again, it is a Nest and Google product. It's got the Google Assistant built in, which means it has a microphone, which means while you're cooking, if your hands are dirty, you can just use your voice to pull up content. And I keep talking about this in the kitchen because it seems like the most natural place for a device like this, but obviously you can place this anywhere you want. It's also got remote gesture control. So one example was if an alarm goes off, you can turn to it and just wave at it and the alarm will turn off. And it's also not that expensive. It's going to cost $229 when it ships in the summer. It'll be available in the US, UK, and Australia. And again, $229, not bad. The previous Google Home Hub, now called the Nest Hub, is dropping in price from 149 to 129 So it's a similar product, just smaller, without face match and without the built-in camera and all the features that that camera allows. So if you want a Nest Hub, but without the larger display and with a little more privacy, you can get the normal Nest Hub rather than the Nest Hub Max for 129 instead of 229 Those were the two big hardware announcements coming out of Google I.O.'s 2019 keynote yesterday. The new Pixels, and the new Nest Hub Max. Okay, next week we will have the announcement of the new OnePlus 7 Pro smartphone. I will be in New York City for that, and I'll have my hands on it next week as well, so expect impressions on the new OnePlus 7 next week here on Geared Up. And the week after that, I'll be in London for the launch of the Honor 20 smartphone, so look out for news on that the week of May 20th. From there, we will be going into Apple season. WWDC is right around the corner as well, so a lot of big things coming up here on Geared Up. Hey, if you're not subscribed and you like what you hear, just search for Geared Up, two words, not one, in your favorite podcast app. 
We're in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, or really anywhere else you can think of. My favorite podcast app is Overcast for the iPhone, and they just launched something called Clip Sharing. So if you're listening to a podcast and you want to share a clip, it'll let you share up to one minute of a clip to your favorite social media sites, and it'll play that clip right there without someone having to be a subscriber to the show so you can share your favorite moments from your favorite podcasts. Of course, I want to hear from you. You can follow me over at youtube.com slash gear live or twitter.com slash Andrew Edwards or over on Instagram at Andrew. Send me messages. Let me know what you think of the show. Let me know what you want to hear on the show. Any feedback you leave me, of course, I'll read it and get back to you. If you like what I do here, consider leaving a rating and review. It really helps other people find the show. Again, big thank you to National Car Rental for sponsoring Geared Up. And big thank you to you for listening. Until next time, I'm Andrew Edwards, and I will catch you in the next episode.